Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Let's go to the book of Acts. We're going to cover two chapters. I'm going to help summarize some of it, though, just to help us accomplish that much. We left last week with the words being yelled, kill him, kill him. They wanted Paul dead. And this, the courage in this man of God is incredible. He has the courage to want to stand before those who want him dead to speak to them. And he's about to share their testimony. And even if that's a lesson you take today, my friends, let us be courageous for the Lord. Let us not be afraid to speak for the Lord and to share what God has done for us. Acts 22, verse one says, brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. He was speaking in Aramaic. They didn't expect that. Then Paul said, and he tells his testimony, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. So he was a Jew, but born in Rome. And I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. Sorry, I said Rome, but he was a Roman citizen. And I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, meaning the Christians, the believers of Jesus. Paul said, I, I was hounding some to death arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify this is so. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. So Paul is saying, look, I, I, used, I know your zeal against people. I used to be that. I know your zeal against what I preach now. I used to be that. So he, he once was like them, but now he is with Jesus and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they don't like this. He goes on in his testimony, as I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, this is his conversion, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus and there you will be told everything you are to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. And a man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and well regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And at that very moment, I could see him. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one, meaning Jesus, and hear him speak. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. So this is his moment to be an apostle. You had to witness Jesus to be an apostle. And so he had a revelation from Jesus. He got to meet Jesus on this road to Damascus. What's interesting is, is God blinds him so that he can see. He needed to be blinded to get a fresh perspective of what he was doing to Jesus and his followers. He needed to go through what he went through to have a, a shift in his perspective and now he feels bad for what he's done and he's ready to serve the Lord. Verse 16 says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. And that's the way you are saved is when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you are water baptized to declare that in front of everyone before the Lord to publicly confess your salvation. So listen, when we get water baptized, we're not going through some ritual. All right, we're not going through some ritual that we have to do this. It is a public 
declaration that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not some religious routine. Okay, next you do this, next. No, it's from the heart. I'm willing to, to identify with Jesus and share even in his suffering if I have to as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so and I want to encourage you, if you have not been water baptized yet, to definitely sign up for our next one and we want to celebrate with you. It's important that I clarify that because some people think that that's how you're saved is if you're water baptized. That's not true. We are saved by grace through faith, right? So we believe in Jesus Christ and it's the grace of Jesus Christ that saves us. Then we, we obey the word that says to be water baptized, to take communion, those things that Jesus asks us to do. And so we do that out of already a changed life. I just wanna make sure we clarify that. Verse 17 says, and he's still sharing his testimony. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. What does that word mean here in the Greek? It means this uh, ability to not hear anything else around you except for the words coming from Jesus. Okay, so it wasn't anything weird or creepy. It was just, he was in this state of mind where the Lord was speaking clearly and nothing else mattered around him. And what's next is the vision. So verse 18, I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, so he's hearing clearly from Jesus a vision for him saying, hurry, leave Jerusalem for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. So this is why he had to have a season away from Jerusalem after his salvation experience. He had to get away for a little bit and he got training, he, he got discipled, um, he learned some things from other believers and he grew in his own walk with the Lord, all right? Verse 19 says, but Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul said that word, the word Gentiles. These Jews did not believe, did not have the same view of him, as him that this message of reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles was gonna happen. This was something that Jesus was teaching Paul. This is something that Jesus has called him to. What we're seeing here is the prejudice against Gentiles from the Jews. And it, and it bothers them so much that they are ready to kill him once again. So it didn't work. What he hoped would work did not work. And they, they began to shout, verse 22, away with such a fellow, he isn't fit to live. They yelled, threw off their coats, tossed some handfuls of dust into the air. Wow, things aren't going well for him in this situation. The commander brought, up, brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. He wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. And when they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? Remember, he was born in Cilicia, so he's a Roman citizen. When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and asked, what are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. So the commander went over and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I certainly am, Paul replied. I am too, the commander muttered, and it cost me plenty. But Paul answered, but I am a citizen by birth. The soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrew. They were actually startled by this claim because they could get in big trouble for doing this when they heard that he was a Roman citizen. And the commander was frightened because he had ordered him bound and whipped. The next day, the commander ordered the leading priest into session with the Jewish high council. He wanted to find out what the trouble was all about, so he released Paul to have him stand before them. So Paul is now gonna be standing in front of the high council, the Sanhedrin, these Jewish leaders, the high priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, um, and he's, he's gonna speak before them once again. Thank you, by the way, for reading through the Bible with me. I know that's a lot of reading right now, but it's a gripping story, isn't it? It's dramatic. And remember, the whole point of this series is how Christianity came about, and, and it wasn't easy, was it? 
And so it takes perseverance and endurance on our part to carry on the gospel. And Paul has, is enduring once again these, this trial that's unfair. And this is him before the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish council, in verse one of chapter 23, gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Sounds good, right? Instantly, Ananias, a different Ananias, not the one we read earlier, this is the high priest. The high priest commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. Well, that didn't go over the way he thought it would go over. Let me pause for a moment. They believe he's wrong. They believe he is guilty of things that he doesn't, he shouldn't have a clear conscience. So they're smacking him. But I also think that because this is on false claims, this high priest is trying to sell this moment in front of everyone to make him look bad. Exaggerating and slapping him on the face. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. Whoa. In some translations, you might see whitewashed wall. Meaning the wall on the outside is clean, but on the inside, you're evil and wrong. It was a, this was like, Paul, you probably, maybe you shouldn't have said that. If you want to get out of here alive, you know. And he says, what kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? And those standing near Paul said to him, do you dare insult God's high priest? I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't realize he was the high priest, Paul replied. For the scriptures say, you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Now let me pause there for a moment. Some people believe that he's actually sarcastically saying, I'm sorry, because knowing Ananias is a corrupt high priest, and he was, he historically was known for taking more money than he should and treating people unjustly for a high priest. And as we can see, he's guilty of that right now in our story. He shouldn't be doing this to Paul. So he's kind of incriminating himself. So some believe he, uh, Paul is sarcastically um, apologizing, saying, I didn't realize you were you know, the high priest, the way you're behaving and treating me. And that could be very well what's happening here. I, I struggle with that, that viewpoint for this reason. It seems that Paul genuinely apologizes and then uses scripture to correct himself. I don't think he would use scripture to correct himself if he was joking. You don't want to use scripture that way. That's a little irre irre um, irreverent to the word of God. So I lean more towards he did not realize who the high priest was at the time for a couple of reasons. One, they said his vision was bad because of all the beatings to him and all the lashes to his body, his face, things like that. Two, he's been gone for years, okay? It's about 15 years removed to 20 years removed since he's been in Jerusalem. He's been in, in Gentile nations and he's been traveling around the region for so long, he didn't know. I lean more towards he didn't know and he did a sharp rebuke to the high priest and that, that doesn't go well. And so he apologizes. He actually genuinely seems to apologize. I shouldn't have done that. He's quoting Exodus 22, 28. You should not speak evil of any of your rulers. So I lean more towards that interpretation. Now, Paul is very wise because the wisdom of the Holy Spirit is with him, amen? And the wisdom of the Holy Spirit could come upon you when you're in situations like that. And do you remember when Jesus told the, the, the disciples before he sent them out two by two, um, be gentle as doves and, and wise as serpents or cunning as serpents. Be, you know, be careful how you live and be careful how you handle situations. Use wisdom, be gentle too. And it's interesting, Paul does something here. He, he sees the room he sees it's not going well for him and he uses his Pharisee history to appeal to that. So in the room are Pharisees and he uses that to stir up confusion in their camp instead of the focus being on him. Pretty wise. Check this out in verse six. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, brothers, I'm a Pharisee as were my ancestors, ancestors, and I am on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. 
This divided the council of the Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all these. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. <clears throat> we see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or angel spoke to him. And that did happen. Jesus spoke to him. As the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. And while he's back in the fortress after such an uh, exhausting day, trying day, most likely afraid, nervous about what's going to happen next, Jesus shows up. How many need Jesus right now to show up in a situation you're going through? Yeah. Jesus shows up, says, be encouraged. Paul, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged, Paul. And just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. You're gonna go to Rome. <clears throat> what does this speak? One, the Lord is there watching over him. He's watching over us today, amen? And God has a plan and purpose for your life and God had a plan and purpose for Paul. It's not over yet. There's still another chapter to your story, Paul. You can have hope. I know it's scary. I know it's hard, but I'm here and I have plans for you to be in Rome. And let me tell you something. When God says that he's gonna do something in your life, he's gonna do it. And this is coming from the Lord directly. So Paul knows. Now I wanna summarize the rest of this chapter. While he's being reassured, the enemy is coming up with something in the background. 40 zealous Jews that are against Paul take an oath to not eat or drink until Paul is dead. They want him gone. They want him out of the picture. They go to the Jewish high council asking that they would ask for Paul to come back one more time to be heard, to be talked to. On his way there, they would take him out. They would assassinate and kill him. 40 men, not looking good. And Paul doesn't know this. Paul is in prison somewhere else. And don't you know God fights for you in the background? Do you know that Paul's nephew overhears the plan and warns the Roman commanders what's gonna come and the Roman commanders listen to this young boy and get hundreds of soldiers together to get Paul out of that prison cell that night at nine o'clock and take him to the next destination and protect him on the way. Let me tell you, God is good. God is looking out for you. God is looking out for me. God is looking out for the church. Amen. It's the protection of the Lord. Well, he escapes that threat. By the way, whenever someone made an oath like that, they would have to now get a lawyer and remove that oath so they wouldn't die because it failed. So all 40 of them had to lawyer up and remove that oath with the Jewish priests. That way they wouldn't die. Isn't that wild? <clears throat> so Paul is now in Caesarea and, he, and he's waiting there and the governor says, I will hear, hear your case myself when your accusers arrive. The governor told him, then the governor ordered him kept in the prison at Herod's Headquarters. So that's the rest of our, that's our two chapters today. I want to talk to you about the conscience. Preserving a godly conscience. If we go fast through the scripture, we miss something. That Paul, an innocent man, before this mob of people, he apologizes for disrespecting a ruler over him or a leader in this community. He says, I come to you with a clear conscience. And even as he makes that mistake, he apologizes and then quotes scripture to correct himself to keep a clear conscience before God and everyone else. You would think that he wouldn't have to do that. You know, he's being mistreated. He wants to be a man that is after God's own heart to have a clear conscience before the Lord and everyone else. And I wanna to talk to us today about preserving a godly conscience. And did you know that we all have a conscience? Let me tell you what it is. The conscience is a gift from God 
to help us know what is right and wrong. Romans 2, 13 through 16 speaks of this, for merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. This was Paul talking about how they followed the law and we do know this, that no matter how much they obeyed the law, it didn't make them clean on the inside. And that's why Jesus had to come on the scene, fulfill the law, shed his blood for us so that we could be forgiven of all of our sin. This is the gospel. And then we believe in what Christ did for us because we can't perfectly obey the law. And so Jesus perfectly does that. And now he's the righteousness that we need. So when we believe in Jesus, we are seen as righteous, we are made righteous. The Bible teaches this concept. We are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. So Paul's not saying obey the gospel or obey the, the commandments and then you'll be saved. The commandments tell us what is right and wrong. The commandments act as a conscience for us, but only through salvation or faith in Jesus is what brings us salvation. Amen. Are you following me on that? Okay. So, but he's speaking here before the gospel is being um, proclaimed in the way he proclaims it in Romans. This is Romans 2. So he goes on to ex uh, express the gospel in Romans 3. Verse 14 says, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law. So even the Gentiles who didn't have the commandments show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. Like they know it's wrong not to kill people. They know it's wrong to steal. They know it's wrong to covet. And they know these things without ever having the law. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. Yikes. That's another message for another day. But God knows your inner thoughts. God knows your motives. God knows your hearts. So we have a conscience. Everyone does. Some of us, sometimes in our world, and hopefully not us, it's being seared. It's becoming so dull that we don't anymore think something's right when it is or something's wrong when it is. And in our society, we have flipped it. What is wrong to some people is now right, and what is right to some people is now wrong. Isaiah talks about this, the prophet. Now, secondly, upon salvation, the Holy Spirit gives us a godly conscience that wants to do the will of God. Thank you, God. Because before salvation, we wouldn't have the ability to do the will of God. We wouldn't even have the desire to do the will of God. We would have a conscience, a good conscience, hopefully, but not necessarily a godly conscience. And this was made about by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. Hebrews 9, 13 through 14, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, a calf or a cow, cattle, could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity, even sheep and lambs, goats, just think how much more, though, the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds. You ready for this? Purify our hearts and our minds so that we can worship the living God. In other words, we can't truly worship God until our heart has been made new through the power of the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit joining in us. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Philippians 2.13 says it in an easier way. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God gives you a godly conscience through his Holy Spirit. Thirdly, when we have this godly conscience, we must preserve and grow our godly conscience by obeying God's word by obeying God and his word. So in other words, your conscience can be affected if you're not careful. We preserve it, we can grow it. If we follow the word of God, our conscience will continue to be sensitive to God, amen? If we disobey God, we'll begin to not care what God thinks or says in his word. This is the effect that happens on mankind. 
But Psalm 119, nine through 11 says this, and this is for all people, but it says, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. You see, if we obey God's word, it would become a pattern in our lives and our conscience would be sensitive to God and his word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. Don't want church and young people to old everyone. Let's not wander from God's word. We can lose our conscience if we do. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we store the word of God in our heart, it helps us remember what is right and what is wrong. So we choose hopefully the right path. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Notice that word, realize. Sometimes we need to be awakened again to what is right and what is wrong. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Let me tell you a story. My father's here actually, so that worked out. Many years ago as a youth pastor here, we would have team meetings and pastor brings us all together for training and, and prayer and instruction for us just to help the church continue to go forward. And my father and I, he was the lead pastor at the time, I was a youth pastor. We had a sharp disagreement, I don't know if you remember this moment, but we had a sharp disagreement over some methods of ministry, not, not theological disagreements or anything like that, just ways of doing ministry, we had a disagreement. And I was not submissive to my leader. And instead, I was fighting him in front of all the other leaders, which is very disrespectful to all the leaders. And most of all to you, disrespectful to you in front of all the leaders. Later that day, we talked on the phone and, you know, I shared my viewpoint on why I didn't think that was the right move for us. And, and he shared his viewpoint. Um, and I was wrong. I was wrong on the phone. I'm not sure if I apologized yet on the phone, but I think I did. That night I went home and I was going to read my Bible. I probably should have read it in the morning before the meeting. <laughs> Would have really helped. And I was reading, I was in the Old Testament and literally the next day for me to read that night, this was my topic. It was about King Saul chasing David. And King Saul had lost his, had lost the crown, so to say, in God's eyes, and it was being given to David. But it had not been transferred. The power of transfer had not happened yet because King Saul, by the way, my dad is nothing like King Saul, so don't make that correlation. <laughs> okay. But King Saul kept chasing David to kill him because he was a threat to his leadership and his seat of power. And this is the time where once again, God delivered King Saul into David's hands and King Saul was using the restroom in a cave and David's men said, kill him now, we have him, take him out because they're all hiding in the cave. And David couldn't do that because he didn't want to disrespect him and, and hurt him, he, he disagreed with them. But what he did was he cut a little piece off of, of his robe, off the King Saul's robe and kept it. And later on, he would show King Saul, King Saul, if I wanted to kill you, I could have done it already. God has given me in your hands, but I didn't do it. I'm paraphrasing. But even the scripture says that even that convicted David. Even taking a little piece of fabric off of the king's robe, he said, I should not touch the anointed, the one that's been anointed by God. As you can imagine, I was deeply convicted by God that night because I realized I had disrespected someone who was not like King Saul, but was more like King David. I had disrespected him in front of the entire staff. So that night I wrote an email to every staff member in that meeting apologizing and said that will never happen again. Yeah, amen. I say that to say, it may be minor in some of our eyes, but to God, it's not. 
It may be minor to you that Paul apologized and said and corrected himself with scripture and said, I shouldn't do that. But it's not. It's not minor because as soon as we compromise on the little things, we start giving in to the big things. And God had to deal with me over that. And I don't think I ever did that to you again, right? All right, good. Good to hear. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So you pastors aren't perfect. I want to speak to you as a pastor that's been called to be prophetic in the generation that we're living in. I get it now. God has called me to be a prophet for him. He has called me to speak for him. This past week, God put something on my heart that I can't escape. And I must, I must proceed in this message by turning my focus on the conscience of our nation. Because the church must preserve its godly conscience for the sake of its community and nation. In other words, We, as the church, must keep our conscience, otherwise our nation is doomed. We must lead by example. Scripture says in Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't live or think or do what it does, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What this scripture is implying is as we do not copy the customs of the world and as we deposit the word of God, we will know what God wants us to do in this community and in this nation. We should not copy this world. We should not conform to this world. And we live in this world, but we're not of it. And the pressure of this world is always around us, isn't it? trying us and testing us to compromise on what we know to be true. The church must hold this conviction. No matter the pressure, this truth remains. The righteousness of God is still right and the wickedness of sin is still wrong. No matter the pressure, the righteousness of God is right. And the wickedness of sin is still wrong. The church has been called the conscience of a nation. This means we need to be careful to preserve our moral clarity and conduct. If we lose our way, we cease to be the stopgap for the moral decay in society. It's the Christian that helps quell the darkness. It's the, the, the church that helps push back the darkness from overtaking our society. They don't realize it, but we are helping our society. But don't just take my words for it. The great leader, Martin Luther King Jr. said this, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. In other words, we will lose our ability to influence the culture if we remain silent and then live with the wrong conscience. Our lives speak of God and shine his light, but also our voices must continue to speak. So I stand here today as a prophetic voice for our church. Our society doesn't need the church to go along with it. Our society needs the church to be the moral conscience and compass to guide it. If we go along with the the society, we are no different than the society and our peril is already set in stone. We must be a stopgap. Jesus called us, you ready for this? To be the salt and light of the world. It doesn't say church, of the world. So it's both. Be the salt and light of the world. And like salt, we preserve and slow decay. And like light, we shine and lead the way. Amen? Let's see if you clap after this next portion. 
I need to bring up a sensitive subject. And if you know me, you know my heart of compassion for all people. I need to bring up the subject of abortion and the sanctity of life today. And I understand if it's too sensitive for you, I would not be offended if you need to walk out. It's okay. I realize that in this room, there could be many that have chosen to do that. And I just want you to know, just like Paul, who encountered a merciful Jesus on the road to Damascus, we as a church are here to show you our love and mercy. God is a forgiving God, a redemptive God. Yes. We understand the complexities of decisions and the difficulties of being hurt by someone that you did not want to be in a relationship with or have an encounter with. We understand that and we do take that in consideration and pray. Our scripture today reminds us that there is redemption for anyone who has and there is forgiveness and we wanna continue to be a merciful place for people who have been down that difficult journey. Scripture also teaches us this, that we are all created in the image of God. He knew you before you were ever even born. Scripture says that Jeremiah was already called in his mother's womb. Human life is in the womb. There's nothing else in there but human life in the womb. We believe that everyone holds intrinsic value. In other words, you are created with value. So you, be, you should be treated such as. You should be treated with dignity and respect. Every human life inside the womb and outside the womb. Even outside the womb. I'll bring that up today too. I want you to know that according to an article published this year in March by Pew Research, the, na- the last national report from CDC on abortions was from 2021. And that year, there were 625,978 abortions reported that year. That's a staggering amount of human life. If there's a silver lining, let me give that to you. It's actually down from 930,160 in 2020. I actually thank God for that, that it went down. Can the conscience of our society be resuscitated and resensitized? Yes. There is hope. In other words, people's views of this situation, people's views of abortion can change. People's views of human life can be changed. If Paul could go from persecuting and sentencing Christians to death, certainly anyone can have a heart change on this subject too. And I'll give you a testimony of that today. But first, I wanna show you something. I promise you I've screened this first before I showed you, you're not gonna see anything traumatizing. You're gonna see a video by a group called Live Action who goes around the nation to help bring awareness to what actually happens in one procedure of abortion. And they're gonna show you their perspective before a minute earlier, then they're gonna show you after they watch this quick clip how their heart changes. And I'm showing you this to illustrate what I'm saying today, that consciences can be awakened and that people's hearts can change. Check this video out.
Yeah. Wow. And just like that, a perspective can shift. Human life is in the womb. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us as a nation. Lord, help us to value what you value, to see this world the way you see it. I wanna give you a celebration point today because I know that's heavy. Our governor, Governor Carney, surprised many of us in the past week or so when he vetoed Bill 140, which is physician-assisted suicide. It was passed, but he stopped it from going forward. He didn't agree with the idea that physicians could assist people in taking their own life. Yeah. We believe that God is the author of life as well as he has the authority to take life and that's up to God when we go. And I wanna say that there are pastors around this nation and even you who will visit hospitals as people are dying that will present the gospel to them so that they will have Christ and they will have eternal life. Our own pastor, Pastor Cornelius, Pastor Kuhn, I myself, thank God for the, the doctors and the medical treatments that are out there right now to help people as they go through very painful circumstances. But there's so many treatments out there that can help them as they pass on to the next life. And we as the church go in and visit them and make sure they're right with the Lord before that happens. That's what we should be doing for people. And what blew me away is, by the way, Governor Carney went against his own party to d decide this. So they're upset with him. But it's what he said that stuck out to me. This is why there's hope. He said, last year, the American Medical Association reaffirmed its view that physician-assisted suicide, quote, is fundamentally incompatible with a physician's role as a healer. Yes, thank you, doctors. Thank you, physicians. Thank you for helping people overcome things and heal. He goes on to say this, and although I understand not everyone shares my views, I am fundamentally and morally opposed to state law enabling someone even under tragic and painful circumstances to take their own life. As I have shared consistently, listen to this. This is his conscience speaking. I simply, I am simply not comfortable letting this piece of legislation become law. Yeah. This is what a conscience looks like. There's still a conscience there. But I wanna say this, and I would lovingly say this to our governor, and I've already emailed him before on subjects, so my voice would be heard, so the word of God would be heard. But if he has a conviction about that life, why not the ones in the womb? I wanna close with this. Let me go back to what the scripture showed. Thank you for being, handling this with so much grace. Thank you for respecting each other in this room. I wanna remind us that Paul apologized, saying, we must not speak evil of any of your leaders. And he did that after he was slapped in the face. And I wanna pray for our leaders because the increasing hostility in the political arena is disturbing. And I know that we all have very um, passionate views of people in office and people running for office. I get it. I understand that we have our grievances. I understand that we're irritated by leaders in our nation. But can I remind you that Jesus died for all people? Can I remind you that God cares for everyone? I, we don't have to agree with everything, but we should still pray and respect those in authority as the word of God teaches us to do. Amen. The word of God says this. And so I, no matter how you feel about President Joe Biden or Vice President Kamala Harris or former President Donald J. Trump or his running mate for vice president, J.D. Vance, 
You need to remember, I need to remember, they have souls. And their families matter too. And we should be praying for the protection of all of them. Just like we would want to be protected by God, we should pray for them as well. Amen. I'm glad you agree. Why don't we stand together if you can, if you can stand. We need to pray for our friends down the South and the Carolinas, all the states that have been affected by this hurricane. Thank you for your support of Convoy of Hope. It's gonna be a blessing. They, they already go out and do what they gotta do. They depend on giving to come in afterwards. And so we're going to um, send a check. So you're gonna, if you're giving, you'll give it to the church and then we'll send a check from the church for all of us. We would need to pray for them. And why am I saying this today? As again, I was led by the Lord to talk about this. It's so important as we approach the next 30 to 40 days that we preserve our godly conscience as a church. And even after the election, after everything coming forward, we must walk the way God calls us to walk and not mirror our culture or conform to its patterns. Amen? Amen. Lord, we come to you and we say, thank you for showing mercy to us. And we don't want to lose your heart that you show mercy to even those against you. You show mercy. You choose to show mercy to whom you want to show mercy to. Even if we don't agree with who you're showing mercy to, you can do it. That's you, you're God. And Lord, we should be grateful for that because what's after this life is either eternity with you or eternity in hell. And we wish none of that on anyone, God. We only wish they would have eternity with you in heaven. Lord, forgive us, God, if we have compromised in our conscience on things that we shouldn't be. And there's so many other things that could be brought up today. Lord, I pray that we would preserve our godly conscience, that we would feed your word, that we would obey your word, God, that the little things would matter and that we would turn from our wicked ways and do what's right, that we would honor you and love you. Thank you for your example through the Apostle Paul and many others in scripture. Thank you for most of all your son Jesus being our perfect example. Lord, we pray for our leaders of our country, those who are running, Lord, their families. We pray for their protection in Jesus' name. Lord, protect them, God. Foil the plans of the enemy. Lord, we pray for their salvation and their sanctification. We don't just pray that they are saved, but we pray that they are changed, sanctified, and living holy, God. God, there is hope that you can resuscitate and resensitize the conscience of our nation. And we know you've called us to be the salt and light of our nation as a church. May we lead the way, God. May we lead by example. So may we not compromise on our end so we can have a clear conscience to lead the way out in our community. I thank you, God, for the unity in the body of Christ that we have here. I thank you, God, for what you've created here in this church. And I pray you'd preserve it as well during this time. I pray we continue to have peace and unity among our brothers and sisters in Christ. That, Lord, we would focus on more what unites us instead of dividing us. It's your son, Jesus. Lord, we lift up all the families in the South, Lord, who have been, their lives have been turned upside down. The damage, the flooding, lives are gonna have to start all over. Lord, would you please intervene? God, show mercy. Lord, lead and guide our leaders to provide the resources. Lord, be with the Convoy of Hope, Samaritan Purse, all the organizations that are helping. God, provide for them. Lord, it's gonna be quite some time for everything to be turned around. So we pray you would help them. God, have mercy on them. And be with the families who are grieving their loved ones who are lost in this storm. Strengthen them today, Lord. Be with them. Lord, let the church be a light in that community. Let the church be a light in those communities, Lord. God, we give you all the glory and praise. We thank you for your word today. Even if it does prick and sting us a little bit, Lord, we want to keep a godly conscience. So help us, Lord, to follow your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.